And then I want to view this subject from very far away, from a distance, and explain what the landscape looks like. And only in the second half will I actually give definitions, and I'll try to go a little bit into the subject. Um, we'll see how far I get. And then hand over to Dick. You'll then do something completely different. Um, so the, the initial motivation, there are several motivations. Initial one is um, that there are modular phenomena in multiple zeta values. And uh, we've seen a couple this week already. Um, so in, in Tasaka's talk, he mentioned Gangel Kanako Zagi relations, which he uh, uh, generalized and, and refined. Uh, I won't write them down. Uh, dual to that um, are what are called the ihara takao relations. Um, so I'll explain later on what these symbols mean. But they showed um, the following uh, relation, or, or near relation, um, that this quantity, whatever it is, I'll explain that later, is zero in two different ways, uh, modulo depth 4 and also uh, modulo 691. So these are elements in the Lie algebra of um, the, the image of the metallic Galois group on projective, on the, the, fun, the unipotent fundamental group of P1 minus 3 points. I'll explain that. And the Dini Harris projector says that these should be, says predicted that these should be uh, independent, and um, they're trying not to be. And this, is relate this existence of this relation corresponds to the fact that there is a non-trivial cusp form for SL2Z. So we understand this fairly well. Um, this 691, for example, should be a consequence of the fact that the Ramanujan cusp form is congruent to the Eisenstein series of weight 12 modulo 691. So we, we don't understand a lot of this, but we're far from completely understanding conceptually where all these things come from. Anyway, so there's plenty of modular stuff going on in the MZV world. A much more grandiose motivation is to try to classify all periods, or all motives. Um, so there are some results in this direction. So I'm just going to mention two examples. The first one is the case of uh, pure motives. We know um, that rank two motives, if you like, or rather systems of compatible Eladic Galois representations, want to be uh, even more um, loose. So these are shown by Andy Wiles and, and collaborators to correspond to the cohomology all to come from the cohomology of modular curves. Of course, with, with coefficients and some algebra vector models. And in fact, you don't need all primes L to do it, so that result is much stronger. Um, but this is the so cohomology. Um, cohomology is something which is abelian. In, in the mixed case, um, you know very little, um, but we can write down all iterated extensions of some rank 1 motives, more precisely tape motives. We can't do it in all cases, but we can do it over Z. And these correspond to the fundamental group of P1 minus 3 points. And um, this is something which is distinctly non-abelian. In fact, so what one has to put here is, is unipotent completion about which more later. So then the, the question then is, what we want to do is, is to take the sort of fiber product of these two um, 
the, not fiber product, the, the cross product of these two different results. And the natural question which arises is um, do all um, possible iterated extensions of motives of modular forms arise from fundamental groups, and not the cohomology of modular curves, but the fundamental group of modular curves. So I'm not going to say anything about base points for now. And we, we can't just take the fundamental group, that's just some group. We need to take some sort of completion. And for now, I'm going to leave this blank. So dot to be determined. So that's the... Um, and so why should you care about that? Well, here's an extremely special case of this. Would be to find the extensions of rankin selberg type. So if you're only interested in, in simple extensions, if you only care about Bayesian block type conjectures, then the, the simplest possible thing here that is not known are rankin selberg type extensions. So something classes in x1 and then whatever that is, q, vf, tensor vgd, where vf, vg are motives of cusp forms f and g, and here d is a large integer. So this is completely unsolved, and um, I believe that that this holds out of that question. And it's a great interest for people who are, who are thinking about the Bertrand's to dark conjecture. This is, seems to be the main line of attack at the moment. Um, OK, so another motivation why this um, should encompass a lot of things is Bailey's theorem implies that every smooth algebraic curve over a number of fields um, can be written as a ramified covering of P1 at, at three points, 0, 1, and infinity. And in particular, it can be uniformized by, um, so it can be written as the upper half plane modulo um, gamma, where gamma is a finite index subgroup of SLTZ. It's not necessarily a congruent subgroup. And so, um, as, as observed by Kottendieck, um, looking at um, these quotients of the upper half plane, or the cohomology of the fundamental group, will certainly contain the motives of all curves. So here, here's a sort of picture of the landscape. We want to look at a non-abelian version of this. So we're going to look at fundamental groups of um, these sort of non congruence modular curves. And by barely, this, this is going to receive, it's going to take, contain the H1 of all possible curves, or the motives of all, of all curves, as well as algebraic number fields. And the simplest possible case of this is going to be M11. So that's the case we should start with. So here, M11 is the Orbifold quotient of the upper half plane by SL2Z. And this thing also generalizes in different directions. It goes off into um, the fundamental groups of moduli spaces of curves MGN. And this in turn is connected to, um, well, of course these are mapping class groups. So there's a whole industry um, studying applications of these, and interestingly, um, the cohomology of the outer fair by conservative theorem. So this leads to a whole other set of uh, applications. Um, so this is the reason why, from now on, I want to focus on sort of a, as as the test the test of this theory. 
we should think about this space because it's at the intersection of many different crossroads. There's another reason why M11 is particularly important from um, the, the uh, moduli space perspective. I'll mention that briefly. So it's a principle that goes by many different names. Um, and I probably get into trouble for not mentioning all the different versions of this. But let me just mention, it's just a couple of lines that, that Gordon Deep wrote in his Eskisna program. And he called it the two-tower principle. And the essential idea is that the, the, um, the, the, the one and two skeleton of MGN bar is generated by um, just four um, spaces, M05, M04, M12, and M11. And um, so by version of Van Kampen's theorem, it's enough to only consider these four guys. So, so that M04 and M05 are, are sort of very well understood. This is really the this is this this is the mixed tape world, and it's been studied a lot by Deligne and, and, and Drinfeld here, um, and Hara and so forth. What I'm focusing on today is this object, and um, you would only need to know this uh, fundamental group, and it would essentially generate um, everything. In, in, in this, this, this uh, tower of fundamental groups of moduli spaces. Now, the, the thing is here is that um, to get from M11 to M12, you need very little, and that's exactly what Dick's going to talk about this afternoon. What am I talking about? M E N. Well, you can change your mind. But the, this is highly non mixtate, and the extra stuff <coughs> is, in fact, mixtate, and sort of belongs to this picture. So, really, everything is being generated by this guy. Okay, so um, from now on I'm going to focus on M11. So the next question to ask is what, it, what notion of completion do we want? And um, the naive guess is just to imitate what's well understood and take unipotent completion. And the first thing you find that is it's completely trivial. You get absolutely nothing. Um, at the other extreme, you could look at algebraic completion of the fundamental group, and it's way too big. So, like the the story of the uh, three the three bears, and <laughs> so you got there before I could even say it. But the three bears, <laughs> there's something called relative completion, which is. Oh, um, first of all, because there are no modular forms of weight 2 on, uh, of level 1. That's a quick answer. Other ways to say it, yeah, that's a simple one. There are 100 ways to say it. The alienization of SL2Z is finite. Right. Yeah, lo lots of... Uh, um, pi 1 rel is just the right size. So this is um, um, completion uh, relative to uh, a map. So we have gamma to SL2Q. So here gamma is SL2Z. So I'll give the definition later on. We'll postpone that for now. Uh, so this is just the right side. That hopefully motivates the program. The idea is that this, this system of, of um, relative completions of fundamental groups of modular curves, they don't even have to be congruence, um, related to congruence subgroups, uh, should be extremely rich. And right now it's the best chance we have, the best idea we have for constructing iterated extensions of uh, motives of modular forms. 
Okay, so now, since um, many of you are very familiar with P1 minus B points, I'm going to compare and contrast um, the familiar setting of P1 minus B points with uh, M11 and just list a um, uh, objects and constructions that are familiar here and explain the analogues over here and how they're different. Um, so, first of all, um, base points. So here we have um, the tangent vector 1 at 0 and minus 1 at 1. So we've seen this uh, in many talks already this week. Um, here on M11 we have the the Q disk, so that the tangent vector is d by dq, where q is the coordinate on the Q disk, and its relation to the upper half plane is the usual one, q equals equal to 2 pi i tor. So remember that h is tor in c such that n tor. Um, so now some paths. Um, sorry, no, I don't want paths yet. I want the, fundamental, the topological fundamental group. So here we want. Sorry, is this going to be a Betty? Uh, I'm going to do. Well, I'll do what I can. I'll do what I can. So now it's just to try and get a picture, get a sense of where things lie. So the topological fundamental group, I'm not going to specify with respect to which base point, is a free group on two generators. And here, um, the topological fundamental group, so this is an orbifold fundamental group, is just SL2Z. So for gamma from now on will be SL2Z. Um, so here we have some very famous parts. We have um, DCH, the Poishama, usually mistranslated as the straight path, but it, it really means the righteous path. <laughs> um, but there are also um, some, in, in the theory, they're very important role played by the uh, inertial paths. So they this is in the groupoid of paths from zero from, from this to this. This is in the fundamental group based here, zero, and um, gamma one is in the fundamental group based at one. So the analog of, of, of the straight path is the element S, uh, which is the usual usually denoted by this matrix in SL2Z. So, um, on the upper half plane, so this is the fundamental domain, the upper half plane, it's just um, corresponds to the imaginary axis. We can think of it as a path from zero to I infinity. It's really a, a path with this tangential, from this tangential base point to itself. It's a, it's a loop. So if that's not clear, another way to draw this would be, this is M11 then, and the tangent vector d by dq, then s does something like this. Um, and then the analog of the inertial path, there's only one in this setting, and it's the translation. And in the q disk, it's just a simple loop around the origin. Um, Right, so there's a path. Okay, then, so what's going to play the role of the Mativic, Mativic pi 1? Um, so here it is pi 1 Mativic p 1 minus 0, 1 infinity. And you can do different things, but we tend to do um, the path torsor. So paths from from here to here, um, you, can, you can take a group if you like. 
But, so let me write this note, unipotent for now. And what is this? This is an affine scheme. It's not a group scheme, because the endpoints aren't the same. It's an affine scheme over Q in the category of mixed hate motives over the integers. So what that means is, um, so you can do algebraic geometry in a Tanakian category, which it sounds very grandiose, but what that means is that the affine ring of this object has the structure of a mixed hate motive. And equivalently, it's saying that um, the, the various realizations of this thing, Betty and Duran, admit an action of a group. So it's saying you have a group with uh, a group acting on it. Okay, we'll come back to that. So the end of unipotent completion here will be relative completion. So this is now an affine group scheme. Um, and over Q, we'd love this to be a motive. I'm um, sure it is. But um, the technology isn't there, really. So the easiest solution is to work in a category of realizations. So I'll use the category H I mentioned in one of my earlier talks. Um, but it has more structure. It actually has a limiting mixed hot structure, as shown by, by Dick. So the way to encode that is as an object in this category with an extra filtration. which we call W. So the weight filtration in this will, will, will be called M. So the weight filtration will be called M, and the filtration will be called F. So this is how to encode an empty mix hot structure. It's kind of fixed. You just look at W filtered objects in H. OK, then here it is. I'm going to say that it's an it's affine ring yeah. is a hop algebra is, is a hop algebra object in, in H, and it admits a filtration W so that every W piece of it is um, an object in 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 H. I, I may say that later on. Okay, so continuing the table. Um, periods. So as we all know, the periods of P1 minus P points are iterated integrals along the straight line path of differential forms which are really coming from um, well, these represent classes in H1 of P1 minus P1 infinity. And these are all linear combinations of MZVs. And as we know, all this, this sort of motivic stuff and Galois theory can be read off relations and properties of M's and V's. Um, here it's more tricky. The periods include, but are not restricted to, that's an important point, integrals along this path S, interpreted correctly as a path between tangential base points of one forms, where omega i is um, f i tor x minus tor y to the 2n d tor. So I'm not going to agonize over the interpretation of x and y yet. This is very familiar to people who, who know the theory of modular forms. So here f i um, is a modular form of weight 2n plus 2 of full level. And you can think of this, so what is f? This is an integral from 0 to i infinity 
Um, so it's some kind of a regularized, uh, it's canonically regularized, um, iterated, um, Eichler, I'm not sure how to call it, Eichler or Shimura integrals. Um, so in the converted case, these were uh, considered by Manny. But, so the, the periods include these numbers, but there's more. Um, and these have been studied in the, the thesis of my world. Um, so examples of these numbers include um, special values of L functions of modular forms uh, at all integers, both critical and non-critical. The critical ones are easy, that's classical, that's a classical Eichler, Shimano theorem. Um, the non-critical ones are more tricky. And of course we get MZVs as well. And a whole bunch of other stuff. <clears throat> um, so here we have, what are the analog of associators? So here we have the Drinfeld associator, which I'm just going to write a zeta of a, a zeta of a word in, in letters 0 and 1, and here's a word in letters 0 and 1. You all know what I mean. Um, the analog of the Drinfeld associator is what I've called CS, canonical co-cycle, evaluated on the, the, the path S. So again, it's a generating series of these integrals. So let me just write it as a shorthand again. I, I, there's no, I don't want to go into great detail of what these symbols mean, but it's, just think of it as the generating series of, of all possible iterated integrals of this type and, and the type that I haven't written down. And so um, Dick uh, gave a talk called the modular inverter. This is the, the, um, the image of this. So the, the Tate quotient, or the mixed Tate part of this, would give the modular inverter that Dick mentioned um, a couple of weeks ago. Um, relations. So here we have associator relations, double shuffle, um, and a whole bunch of others. And here we have um, these CSs for non-abelian co-cycles. So we have co-cycle equations. And we have some more. We have funny things called transference relations. Um, and we don't know in general. And now I come to the question of what the underlying theory of motives should be. So here, here the issue is, is, is not that there is currently no abelian category of motives. Um, if today you told me there is uh, a Tanaki category of mixed motives, I'd be very happy. But it wouldn't help us in any way at all. Um, what we really need is um, Bateson's conjectures, which is something different. That would be something. Is there an analog of the quantum group on the right hand side? Big one. The analog of quantum group on the right hand side. Ah, oh, that's a nice question. Um, analog of quantum group. Yeah, let me think about that. I haven't thought of that. That's a good question. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, for me, a quantum, quantum group is, is the basic idea of quantum group is that uh, an affine group scheme is a commutative Hopf algebra. And um, well, you start off with abelian groups, so it's a commutative, co-commutative Hopf algebra. And then you can generalize that to take a commutative Hopf algebra that's not necessarily co-commutative. But to be a scheme, it still has to be commutative to take its spec. And then you say, okay, well, let's drop the commutativity assumption and look at non-commutative, non-co-commutative Hopf algebras. And so that's the naive definition of a quantum group. It doesn't necessarily have anything to do with this. Or, the associativity but, of the algebra. The, yeah, so the, the stuff on, on uh, double affine heck algebras and all that, I haven't, I haven't thought about what it corresponds to here. There, there may be something there. Um, motives. 
Okay, so here we're very much in the mixtape world over Z. And so the way to think about this is that we have um, G, we have a, a, a Tanaka group of a category of mixtape motifs acting on the Duran version of this uh, motivic fundamental group. <coughs> Right, and it's some sort of a miracle that we know anything about this action. Um, but it, it is possible to, to, to get formulae for, for how this acts. Um, the Lie algebra of this, that's right, GMT to be... Um, I really should put graded Lie algebra, but I'm going to be sloppy and just put the Lie algebra of this group. And you know that, that when I write a, a free Lie algebra, you should complete it. I'm not going to write that. So this is the, the completion of the free graded Lie algebra on generators. Um, sigma for every odd integer. Um, so where do these sigmas come from? Well, they come from Borel's theorem. Um, so who says that who implies that the extensions in this category of Q by Q of N are um, Q, well, that's really canonicalized more, zero if, as uh, so a Q if N odd bigger than or equal to three and zero otherwise. And so these sigmas correspond to the generators uh, of these extension classes. So more precisely, Sigma 2n plus 1, in fact, corresponds to something slightly different. It corresponds to um, a class, a generator in X, in this X group, dual, tensor with Q of n. Oh, sorry, this is 2n plus 1. So these, these, um, these are. The algebra actually carry a mixed hot structure and they sit in a certain weight. Um, in, in, in a negative, a strictly negative weight. And they correspond by the regulator by Bayon system or conjecture or whatever um, to the odd zeta values. So that's so sometimes the structure of MZVs is entirely determined by some algebra built out of MZV. Now over here we we have we don't have um, these theorems. So we posit the category of mixed modular motors over gamma is precisely the category generated by this relative completion. And what we're going to get then is we get the Duran fundamental group of this category realizations H. It, well, it's going to act on the um, relative completion. And its action factors through some quotient, which is going to be our definition of MNM gamma. Right? And its Lie algebra, let me drop the gamma, is going to be a free Lie algebra um, on all this stuff. So these, these elements are non canonical, by the way. Only the, the images in the abelianization are canonical. So these are uh, zeta elements, but they're going to be, there's going to be a lot more stuff. They're going to be um, modular elements. And so for every cusp form and every integer d, I'll tell you in a minute what the integer d is, you're going to get a modular element. And then, so I know that these exist. Um, you're also going to get rankin selberg elements, and so on and so forth. And these guys, we don't really know whether they exist yet. But there should be um, a very infinite family of generators of number one. And the only grip we have on these um, is Varbainson's conjecture. 
who says that, so for example, let me just focus on this case. What do the sigma FDs mean? Sigma FD corresponds to classes in X1 or something, MM for the sake of argument, or we could put MMM, of Q by VFD dual tangent VFD. So v You're just using the fact this is a freely algebra to just say that the X generate the, <coughs> generate the, the real algebra. <coughs> Somewhere here we're, we're using. We don't know that it's. What is the situation? Um, we don't. Yeah, we don't know that this is free. Oh. Yeah, so what I've written is not quite correct. Right. Um, we posit. So it, this is conjectural. So Benson's conjecture tells us what generators we expect. So to this find. is sort of a conjecture, not a conjecture. And then we hope. So Benson tells us what generators we should have. He tells us what the x1s are. Then we expect that x2s in the category of mixed motors vanish. And so that gives us a freely algebra. And then the next question is, does it act freely on this? In which case, does, have we constructed all the extensions explicitly by our construction? So that's, that's the logic of it. Um, we know what to, how big this should be, and, and we want to ask. We don't care about x2s for now. We know what uh, generators we should have, um, and we ask whether it acts freely. So let's, let's put this modulo possible relations. And we expect the relations to be trivial. Um, so what does this modular element correspond to? It correspond so Bainson tells us that this should be rank 1 for D bigger than or equal to the weight of F. And the regulator is the special value of the L function LFD for D, so these are non critical values. So these, these generators, sigma correspond to, this is a rank 2 thing, so, so this, this, these generators correspond to a copy of the motor of a modular form. Okay, so maybe I'll. I'll um, so it's really I'll park that. Sigma FD tensor grid. Yeah, so yeah. I haven't made up my mind. I initially thought of having sigma FD and sigma F prime D, following a certain author, <laughs> um, and have two generators. Or you can just say this is a Lie algebra over whose generators are pure bus structures. And, and, and sigma FD is the symbol which represents the, the, the cosmos of this two dimensional way. It's a bit cleaner to do it this way, because the, the, these X groups grow in rank. So for the rank and Selberg elements, for, for D in a certain range, they're, they're rank 1. And then for D very large, the X group becomes rank 2, tensed with something which is bigger than rank 1. You, you get lots and lots of elements, it gets a bit complicated. Um, so quickly here, so here, here we know, so it's been mentioned in the talks today, we know that the sigma 2n plus 1 act via add x naught to the 2n x1 in some sense. And the question is, how, how do these elements act? So, so we, we know what the analogs of these formulas should be up on um, relative completion of pi 1 mmm. Um, and then the final comment, which I'll just say in words, uh, is that so we know that the sort of the, the ultimate goal of this is to prove some sort of freeness theorem. And um, so here we know that the sigmas act freely on um, the unipotent fundamental group, and that tells us that the fundamental group generates all mixed state motives over Z. Um, and so what you'd like to say is, like you'd like to conjecture that these elements sigma all exist, and they generate a freely algebra acting freely on relative completion. And so what I can prove at the moment is that all the, the zeta elements and all the modular elements exist, and that they, they act indeed freely on relative completion. But that's not the whole story, because there should be this infinite sequence of Rankin-Selberg generators.
and so on and so forth. Um, good. Okay, so now let me at long last try to define relative completion. And I'll start with just a group. Um, so this, this really, um, I, so I think this, this is a, a really fundamental idea. It's really important. And it's the reason why I've stopped everything and been thinking about this. And there's only one person in the world who's been thinking about that. And that's Richard Hayne. Out in the desert, on his own, for the last uh, three decades. Um, so, you start with gamma, a group, um, and R, a reductive group, reductive algebraic group, over a field K of characteristic zero. And we, you can, in your mind, you can carry around the example gamma equals SL2Z, R is SL2 over Q, and K is the field Q. And you give yourself a representation rho from gamma into the K rational points of your algebraic group, which is the risky dense. So example, um, we have the map from SL2Z into SL2Q. And so what is relative completion? Um, it's the statement that there exists uh, a group G gamma rho, which is pro-algebraic, um, and it sits in an exact sequence So its reductive quotient is exactly the group R you started with, but it has a very large pro-unipotent radical. Um, and it has satisfied some universal property, which I'm not going to write down, but it will be clear from the definition what that is. Um, and um, this homomorphism rho lifts to a map from gamma into the k points of the relative completion, and this is also as a risky dense. And it has the property that when you take the, the quotient back down to, when you pass the reductive quotient, <coughs> this gives back, oh sorry, this gives back the representation row you started off with. So the way to think of this is that if you have a, a, a discrete group sitting densely inside an algebraic group, you can think of this as some kind of algebraic hull of gamma. In other words, that, that um, all this, the, the elements of gamma satisfy the algebraic relations which define this group. Okay, so it's some notion of an algebraic hull, closure of uh, your uh, initial group gamma. <clears throat> So now let me define it. So there are lots of definitions, and I'm going to give the easiest, but maybe the most high ground. Um, so consider the category C gamma rho of um, finite dimensional. gamma representations um, equipped with an exhaustive finite filtration of gamma representations. Oh, so it's called V. Uh, v. Vn equals V. So these are sub gamma representations such that um, v, the successive quotients of Vi over Vi minus 1 is in fact an R module. 
So there's a representation of the algebraic group, not just the point of the algebraic group. Um, and, um, and the action of gamma upon it. So acting on this representation is V, so I've got to say over, these are of, of finite dimensional K vector spaces, right, equipped with a gamma action. So these are vector spaces V over, over our field K. And so the, the K points of this reductive group act, and gamma acts through um, its representation into RK. So that's a category. It's a Tanakian category. Um, and it has a fiber functor, omega, which just forgets which, which forgets all the all the information. So you, you start off with a vector space and you forget the gamma action and you're just left with a vector space. And then the relative completion is defined to be is defined to be the automorphisms of this category with respect to this fiber function. There, there are other more concrete ways of finding it. Um, but this is the quickest, and you immediately get a few properties from it. So what this means is that this, this category C is equivalent to the representations of this group G, uh, G relative completion. If you like, it's the group which classifies um, this particular family of representations of a discrete group whose associated grades, which are filtered and whose associated gradients of, of a specific type, they come from R. Okay. So briefly, I'll say something about the structure. I'm running out of time. So structure, um, there's an obvious functor from this to representations of gamma. And from this, you get a map from the extensions in the category C to X and um, rest gamma QV. So this is whenever V is in rep R. Um, and in particular, you get a map from the cohomology of uh, gamma with coefficients in V to... So this category is equivalent to the representations of relative completion, and therefore this exactly calculates the cohomology of relative completion. <clears throat> so this is the tool you have to get a grip on the size of this, this category, of this, of this group. And you can show... So this was shown by Hain, but it, it's quite easy to do just from the definitions that it's an isomorphism if n is 1, and it's injective if n is 2. So in our favorite example, gamma equals SL2z, etc., and r, r is SL2, and q, n is q. Um, let's Simplify the notations now. So let me call G1, because this is M, M11 is lurking in the background, let me call this G11 to be gamma rho, and let me write U11 for its unipotent radical. You put that in that fact, it's, it's the other way. Uh, the cohomology of scripture gives the cohomology of gamma. Um, because the cohomology is the extra. Oh, sorry, yeah. Just reverse the error. Yeah, I switched them around. Thank you. Um, yeah, gamma's on this side here. Oh, yeah, oh yeah. Um, and then, so what we have then, we deduce from a, a little hostile cell spectral sequence that H1 of the unipotent radical with coefficients in Q is 
the direct sum of H y gamma V n tensor V n dual. This is something very concrete. So let me explain. So V n V n is sim n V one. V one is the standard representation of SL two of SL two algebraic group. So people who do modular forms like to write this very concretely. V n is uh, you can just view this if you like as the space of polynomials of homogeneous polynomials in two variables um, of degree n, right? The, the, there's a natural right action of SL2 on this, and I'm, I'm going to be sloppy about left and right actions here, because um, not everything is consistent. Um, we know also that, that um, H2 of SL2z in anything is zero, and therefore we conclude that the Lie algebra is the completion of a free um, Lie algebra generated by um, H1 SL2Z Vn dual tensor Vn. So these are just polynomials in, in two variables x and y, and these are um, essentially modular forms, rather petty version of modular forms, or well, they're very closely connected to period polynomials, which have also occurred several times this week. Um, okay, so that's relative completion of a group, so now I'm going to go quickly because I want to jazz this up a bit. So we're going to add some structure. Um, so it's very clear how to geometrize this because um, if gamma is the fundamental group, so here gamma is the fundamental group of a, of a, of a, a smooth um, smooth um, connected uh, manifold, then um, we can identify representations of gamma with local systems. So the first thing to do is, is the Betty version of relative completion is going to be denoted G11 Betty, and it's the Tanaka Pi 1, the Tanaka fundamental group, of you just copy this definition, so it's a category, I don't want to write this out in full, but it's a category of local systems on M11, equipped with a, a filtration such that their successive quotients are direct sums of symmetric powers of V1, which is R pi lower star Q, where Pi is the universal elliptic curve over M11. And so clearly, with this comes a lot of extra structure as well. Because it's, it's, a, it's, um, it's a petty commodity of, of a family of multiples, algebraic varieties. Duran, similarly, um, you can define G11 Duran is the Tanaka fundamental group of a category of. Um, algebraic vector bundles, so locally free coherent sheaves of OX modules on M11, equipped with an integral connection with regular singularities, which admit a filtration such that the, su the successive quotients are of a specific type, namely the direct sums of symmetric powers of V1, which is H1 Duran of E relative to M11 equipped with the Gauss Mannion connection. So, this is something very classical, of course, it's just the, the Pickoff Fuchs equation on the, the co 
cohomology of periods of an energy. Can I understand the bottom of Sorry? Uh, by entropy, you mean the and the uh, ones which have this particular filtration, they've been studied by uh, Grenfell and uh, Berenson, and they're, uh, they're essentially open. In that what, sorry? So, um, by Hitchens' <coughs> work, we know that these uh, algebraic vector bundles are based on semi stable Higgs bundles. Okay. And uh, the, the bundles which come with this particular filtration, they've been studied by uh, Berenson and Grenfell under the name of Oper. Okay. So, I wasn't aware of that. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for comments. I'll have a look. I can't immediately comment if, if that if there is a connection or what the connection is. <coughs> but it, clearly, this is a very, very natural. This is a very natural thing to do, and and in fact, if you um, what well, the point I should make is that, that if you're looking at any um, algebraic vector bundles on an algebraic variety, then it's encoded by some notion of relative completion. And that's because any, any algebraic group is an extension of a reductive or pro-reductive group by a pro-unipotent uh, radical. And so if you make your reductive quotient big enough, you capture everything. <clears throat> so this is, this is, here we've restricted it to be just of this type. It's a very natural thing to do. Okay, so Hain has then has done, has shown that the Betty, so but I should say that the, the Betty thing is exactly the relative completion. So this, by the way, is what I called G11 earlier. It's identical. Um, <clears throat> and and the, given by the, the fiber functor at the point of the Q. Um, and Hain has shown that this has a natural limiting mixed hot structure. And so the upshot is that, perhaps a bit of extra work, is that G11 dot, where dot means Betty and Durand, is a W filtered pro object of a category of realizations H, <clears throat> it's actually a group object. It's a group, and in other words, that um, for any n, if you like, you have a, um, a Betty vector space, possibly infinite dimensional, a Durand vector space, and a comparison isomorphism. And you have weight and Hodge filtrations and a lot of compatibilities. Right. <clears throat> and in particular, so the upshot is hence, what do we get? We get that the Tanaka group G Duran of H, which I discussed at length in my earlier lectures, um, acts on G uh, Duran relative completion. So the whole game in this business is to understand how, what you can say when you have a group acting on a group. And it's, it's more subtle than you might think. And so a, a de working definition is a mixed modular motive, um, a mixed um, modular motive for this group gamma is a subquotient. <coughs> of this object, uh, G11, in the category H. In other words, the category of mixed modular motives are all the motives or systems of realizations that you can generate out of relative completions of fundamental groups of modular curves. And what else, what else could it be? Okay, so finally, I, I want to focus briefly on Durham and, and try and explain what the Durand relative completion looks like very explicitly. And the, the point I really wanted to get to, probably only going to be five minutes over, is to draw a picture of it, because I think it, it's psychologically very important to see what it looks like. <clears throat> um, 
So we want to write down the generators of this Frehley algebra, U11 Duran. And we know that they correspond to the Duran cohomology of M11 Vn tensor Vn, the dual here. And this is given by modular forms. So let me briefly tell you what the generators look like. So now I'm going to not work over Q, but work over Q bar, because it's convenient to use Hecker operators to split into Hecker eigenspaces. You don't have to, but it makes life easier. So we have Eisenstein series, E2n plus 2, um, which corresponds to um, the Hecker normalized Eisenstein, Eisenstein series, G E2n plus 2. So we get a, a symbol, if you like, coming from an Einstein series, a differential form. And it is a copy of the Tate motif Q of 1. So when I write Q of 1, this is with respect to um, um, a weight and a Hodge filtrations M and F. So it's of Hodge type minus 1, minus 1. And it sits in this extra filtration, W, equals minus 2n minus 2. Okay, so we've got this extra filtration in the background. And on the other hand, if we have um, two cusp forms, um, so that this is sort of a Hecker pair of weakly holomorphic modular forms that form a Hecker eigenspace, rank 2, and then associated with this pair, you get a pair of generators which correspond to a copy of VF1. <coughs> VF is a hot structure associated to these Hacker eigenforms. And the Hodge numbers are 2n minus 1 and minor uh, and 1 minus minus 1, 2, sorry. 2 2n minus 1, minus 1, and minus 1, 2n minus 1. And these sit in W equals minus 1. So that, these give us the generators of this, because we know by Aikis Shimura that this cohomology is generated by modular forms, aka cusp forms in Eisenstein series. And then this Vn, as I said before, just polynomials. So we can upgrade that Vn. Since I'm behind, let me cut to the um, cut to the chase. So v V1 is the cohomology, the Durand cohomology of the universal elliptic curve of the fiber d by dq, and this is isomorphic to qx plus qy. So x and y are just symbols, and x is a copy of q of zero, and y is a copy of q of one. Maybe I want, I want to dualize this. <coughs> okay, so with that, I will now just draw a picture of the, um, the relative completion and then stop. So this picture is, is the analog for P1 minus 3 points. So in P1 minus 3 points, we just have the 3 Lie algebra of two generators. Uh, e0 and E1, where E0 and E1 correspond to the differential forms um, dx over x and dx over 1 minus x. So maybe, maybe I'll write this. So what I'm doing here is, is writing down the analog of the Lie algebra of pi 1 to around p1 minus 3 points, which is a free Lie algebra on. E0, E1, where E0 corresponds to dx over x, and E1 corresponds to dx over 1 minus x. And so here, you, you, you were, so U11 one one is the free Lie algebra on one of the forms. So the generators are E2n plus 2, x to the i, y to the j, where i plus j equals 2n, and EF, 
X, the I, Y, J, corresponds to a holomorphic class form. And then the same with um, the F prime, which corresponds to a sort of weakly holomorphic evil twin of the class form. So it's just a 3D algebra on these generators. And now let's draw the, the Hodge structure of this, which is the moment I've been fearing. <laughs> it's, it's seriously hard to. Um, okay, I'll try and do it here. So the weight filtration W is going to go down the page, and the M filtration is going to go backwards in the wrong direction um, across the page because we've got into the habit of doing things that way. So this is m degree 0, m degree minus 1, m degree minus 2, and so on, 1 and 2. Now the Lie algebra G11 one, one of G relative completion Again, it's a completion, but, but ignoring that, it's, it, it's non-canonically a semi-direct product of U11 with SL2. So first let me draw SL2. This is the W degree uh, here. So it sits in W degree 0, and we have x d by dy in this lot, nothing here, on h and here uh, y d by dx. So h, h is just the commutators. It's proportional to deg x minus deg y. Okay, so this is a copy of the Lie algebra SL2, and that's its hot structure. <coughs> now minus one, we have all the cusp forms. So out, way out here in 2m minus one, we have an e f x to the two n say, then we have nothing, then we have ef x to the two n minus one y, nothing, and it's going to alternate all the way up to ef y to the two n, here nothing, ef uh, x y to the two n minus one. So this forms a big box here. <coughs> which is a standard representation of SL2 of rank 2n. So these differential operators move you down a couple of boxes up and down uh, at each stage. And so that's the cusp forms. All the cusp forms are sitting at the top, somewhat strangely. And then to get something Eisenstein, you've got to go all the way down to weight minus 4. So this line is very important. M equals W line. Um, so the Eisenstein series are, are centered about this line. So I'm afraid that this, this N should, should be very big. It's not running on the board. I'm kind of drawing the valley. Um, the Eisenstein series, the first one here will be E4 uh, X squared. Nothing this line is supposed to pass through this box and nothing e4 y squared and this is a, a representation of SL2 of dimension 3 and the differential operators go up and down and the next one is e6 so they all begin in the weight minus 2 column so this of course was explained to me by, um, by Dick who worked this out Then we have E six X cube Y nothing E six X squared Y squared Y cubed and E six Y to four and so on so forth. So the Eisenstein series go down the page and they form the bigger and bigger representations. And of course, so when you take the Lie bracket of elements in this Lie algebra, so you take the Lie bracket of E46, then it's, it's going to be down, down to the right. So it's going to be in this column 
minus 4 is going to be way down in the so that's, that's, that's the object, that's the beast we're, we're interested in. And on this, you have the action of a, 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 a group. And the whole game is to understand how it acts on this. No, the L values are more no, so uh, uh, yeah, I said several things. First I said that not all the periods are equally integral to polymorphic modular forms. You can't get everything. Then I said that um, the, the, the critical L values are, are integrals of classical life integrals. To get the non-critical values, you have to look at double integrals and use some rankin selberg method. That's what I meant. Maybe I, I wasn't very clear. So to get the non-critical values, you've got to look at um, double iterative integrals. And isn't it just enough to consider integral of integral of integral of integral of form? You'll get the same as integral of tau to the k? You can reinterpret the tau to the k as an integral if you like. I don't want to do that. You interpret those as, as sections of vector bundles. But um, to, get, to get a non-critical L value, you have to take integral of an Eisenstein series. <laughs> multiply by an Eisenstein series and integrate, and then you have to extract, and that produces multiple zeta values, and special values of L functions, and something else, which is a, a period of an extension of motives, a Q by a motive of modular form, which is not an L value, and you've got to cut that stuff away and, and expose the L value. So this contains special values of L functions, but it also contains other things, which are periods of simple extensions, which are not L. But you can use this description uh, as you're saying. You're describing the free algebra by, 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 with this basis. Yes. Does it correspond to the, the fact that you will later consider only minus type of security thing? No, this basis contains, contains. So in the Eisenstein case, you're lucky because there. So, so in, in this cohomology, the Eisenstein series come in multiplicity 1 because they cut slant to take one, the take of rank 1. And the Eisenstein series is holomorphic. So the Eisenstein class is represented by a holomorphic differential form. And, and it's fine, you can just, that's in Manning's picture, except that Manning doesn't consider regularized iterative integrals. So the class forms is different because it, it occurs as a, a, a rank two submotive of this. And so you have, um, you have the, the holomorphic representative only captures part of the Hodge filtration. And then you have the other part. And the other part is mysterious. And um, we, Dick and I, thought, couldn't find this anywhere in the literature, so we wrote a paper this summer explaining how to compute the quasi periods of a modular form. So I, th I think it, it's equivalent to stuff that was known by Scholl many years ago, but it wasn't anywhere in the literature. And one way to get this is, is to consider um, eichel integrals associated to weakly holomorphic. So a multiple modular mod mod form has four periods, not two. In the literature, you only ever see two, but there are four of them. And that's the fact that there are two hidden periods that, that need to be taken into account, and that's going to propagate. More questions? Yeah. 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 Well, thank the speaker for a very nice job.